filling in for John today, and I have a, a bit of a commercial to give you uh, about all the different activities that are going on in and around the museum in the next few months. One of the things, if you have time after your lunch and after our lecture today, if you wander down the Chute Contemporary Gallery, you'll see a glass case at the end, and it has a maquette of a bronze, or what will be, a bronze figure of Dr. Joseph Warren, which is being proposed to be put in front of the Harmon Museum on the Broadway facade. And Dr. Joseph Warren, of course, was whom Warren County was named after. And he, of course, also was the first to fall at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And uh, we have a group uh, headed up by Dr. Greg Davis, who is starting a fundraising project. And that will be the first full-scale bronze sculpture uh, we have in the county. And I think it's befitting that it goes in front of the building here. If you have been paying attention, uh, there's wonderful news coming out of the United Nations World Heritage Vote. Uh, of course, the last official gathering for the state of Ohio working on getting the Hopewell ceremonial sites into the Declaration of World Heritage Protection was held in this room. We sponsored it. And of course, earlier this week, it was approved. So we now have the Hopewell Ceremonial Works, and it means something incredible. Because as I've been telling the officials that I have talked to throughout Warren County and beyond, that the Ohio State University study says that once that is developed, it will, it will draw 125,000 international visitors a year to Warren County which is wonderful and we're working with the state of Ohio, the Ohio History Connection, and the Hopewell Earthworks Group to make sure that we are a player here at the Harmon Museum. So that's, a, I think, an incredible accomplishment. <laughs> Behind those curtains is not a washer and dryer or a Chevrolet. <laughs> Behind those curtains are a huge accumulation 10 years of accumulation of Christmas decorations that go on sale this Friday and Saturday. So there's everything you've ever dreamed of from all sorts of wreaths to Christmas trees to lawn ornaments and it starts Friday morning at 10 a.m. and we would like it all to go away. So if you love Christmas, do come and get that. Uh, Another thing that we're doing, of course, on this Friday evening, on the 22nd, we have an art opening at 6.30 in the galleries upstairs. The work of Susan Willen. She is uh, using digitally enhanced images, and they're just stunning. So please come and join us. It's free to members and to the public. And we have a wine and cheese reception at 6.30. And come and meet Susan, and I think you'll enjoy uh, working with her. We also, if you look on our website, are selling very quickly the ghost tours and the haunts of Lebanon. And we have some exciting sites. As a matter of fact, uh, there are every Friday and Saturday, every weekend in October. Friday is the walk through downtown. Find out some of your favorite stores and locations. Perhaps might have other unseen visitors. And also on Saturday night, we're going to be hosting your hunt in a particular location. The first two I can announce, the first one will be Harmon Museum at night, which is, believe it or not, creepy. And the second one will be the Lebanon Academy, because Hazel Spencer Phillips wrote a wonderful story years ago about the ghost in the Academy. So join us for those. We also have on our website the great dinner raffle. It's back. If you want to take a chance on winning a pioneer dinner in the Beetle Cabin, a wonderful Victorian dinner up in the gallery upstairs, or a lunar dinner, oh yes, an out-of-this-world dinner, one that was served by President and Mrs. Nixon to the astronauts when they came back and visited the White House. So take a, a look at the website and you can see that as well. October the 6th, we have our wonderful uh, uh, Cemetery tours that begin at Lebanon Cemetery at 6 o'clock. We also have on the 7th of October, out in the Beetle Cabin, that's a Saturday from 11 to 1, the museum has gone ahead and purchased a cider press. 
So for kids and families, if you want to see how cider's made, come on out to the cabin and we'll be making cider on that Saturday. The flea market is on December the 1st and 2nd of this year. And of course, there will be dates announced very shortly for Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus and their time in the Beetle Cabin every December. So that's our wonderful uh, array of things going on. Uh, get involved. There are a lot of new things here at the museum to take a look at. Watkins Catering, of course, is providing your lovely meal. And in just a few moments, I'll introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have enjoyed your lunch. And it's my privilege now to introduce our uh, topic as well as our speaker. The topic today uh, is Until They Are Home, Using Forensic Science to Account for Our MIA Military Personnel. Our speaker, Alejandro Alex Vialiva, will discuss this unique forensic work, his work, in the POW MIA field, where in Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency forensically analyzes recovered material evidence in which it attempts to account for U.S. personnel who went MIA in past conflicts. Alex is a native of Austin, Texas. He's a longtime and highly experienced military historian specializing in the study of the Vietnam War. His specialization is historic, forensic, and technical skill are great assets to the DOD POW MIA Accounting Agency Laboratory at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base here in Dayton, which is tasked to analyze recovered material evidence forms from global loss sites in which to support the national mission to find, recover, and identify U.S. military personnel unaccounted for from past conflicts. As a historian and author, Alex has written published articles on U.S. military equipment used in Vietnam and is currently working and writing on a major book project on the United States Air Force in Vietnam. He's a proud 25-year U.S. Army NCO veteran and has spent the majority of his distinguished career as a military trainer and instructor, having served as a drill sergeant at basic training centers and a drill sergeant leader at the Drill Sergeant School. With no further ado, please welcome our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I was, see if we can maybe use the wireless mic so I'm not standing up here like an auctioneer or something. So bear with me while I try to remove this. Test one, two. Test one, two. Test, test. We're, we're doing the test one, two. I think that goes into Is that for you? Okay, sorry. We'll just leave this up here then. Okay, sorry about that. Now he's going to play back the audio and he's like, whoa, that's loud. Thank you for the opportunity for me to join you this wonderful afternoon. It's a wonderful to have all of you here this, this beautiful September day. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this little known mission that our nation proudly has undertaken, probably now going back to World War II. So the United States of America is unique in the world in that it devotes a tremendous, a tremendous amount of time, effort, and even monetary expenditure in finding our fallen heroes from past wars. Typically, oh, there we go, okay. Oh, okay, thanks, man. appreciate it. Now we can get one Test one, two, can everyone hear me fairly well? Good, okay. I feel a little more freedom with this, I think. So the, the mission is unique, it's noble, and it, it requires a tremendous amount of expenditure, effort, and money, of course. And so, but in terms of, really can't put a price tag on 
finding, recovering, and returning an American back, not only to his nation, but to his family. Because when we see that in action, and it happens on a regular basis throughout every year, it's, it's quite, quite an amazing sight. I've been privileged, I've been honored to have attended three burials of a missing individual at Arlington National Cemetery who had been missing for decades. So for us to bring him home and to, to return him to his family is beyond, it's beyond comparison, it really is. I keep saying him because up to this point, and this will change, as women now find a place in America's fighting forces, they too are fighting on the front line alongside men. But in previous conflicts, as we know, they were entirely men. And the conflict we will focus on today is primarily Vietnam. This young man you see on the screen, ladies and gentlemen, is symbolic of really every American who has served in the armed forces. They're, they're always young. Always, always young. And for anyone over the age of 50, gosh, anyone under the age of 40 is young. Uh, anyone under the age of 30 is really a kid. And I say that with a lot of respect and admiration. So we'll, we'll be, revisit this young man. This young man is United States Navy Lieutenant Commander Jeffrey Martin Krummenhoek, who sadly went missing in Vietnam as he was doing his job as a naval aviator. And we see him there in his regal dress whites. At that point, he's wearing two bars, which make him the rank of lieutenant. And as you see on his left breast, that is the coveted, the, the highly respected whimsical of a naval aviator. And this is taken probably two or three years before his loss in 1967. So let's play with this. I have a unique investiture in this mission because I come from a line of military veterans before me. On the left there is my, my paternal grandfather, George Viella, who was a decorated combat veteran of World War II. He's now since passed in 01, but I was able to, to speak with him and really get as many stories as I could from my grandfather. He was the inspiration from why I, I eventually served. In the middle is my, my father, George Yella, who served in the Air Force active duty from 1954 to 1958. And then of course me on the far, far right. Having enlisted in June of 1991, I retired last year with 32 years of service in the United States Army across three components. <laughs> It's really for the men and women who have preceded me that I have the most profound amount of respect in terms of what impact and what contributions they have made to our nation. Our nation is, is unique in the sense that we have a proud, proud military tradition. And that largely is because of Americans who have served going back to 1775 to the current day. By a show of hands, any, are there any veterans in the audience this morning? Anyone at all? Okay. You'll surely raise your hand for this one. How many of you have had family members who have served in uniform? Yes, so many. We thank you for your family service. Whatever branch, whatever time frame, it doesn't matter. The point is that your family member made a commitment to devote themselves to something bigger, to their nation. That is entirely, incredibly selfless and to be respected. So I thank you for your family service. If I could, how many of the audience this morning had a, a service member, a loved one that served during Vietnam, during the time frame, many of you. And how many of you had a service member, a loved one that served in Vietnam? Anyone, several of you. Amazing. Thank you for, for your family service. Mm -hmm. Vietnam, which we'll speak about in the last 60 years, has been the most significant American conflict. Nothing in the, in the ensuing six decades since really the late 1960s up until the current day has matched the ferocity, the cost, the scope, the depth of the Vietnam War. And that, of course, has its, its number one cost in American lives. Can anyone tell me, in the Vietnam War, which spanned almost 20 years, how many Americans were lost in Southeast Asia? 58,000. Ma'am? 58,000. 58,000. And that's not exact, it's now 58,003. Thank you. So you know the number well. It's an astounding number, ladies and gentlemen. And the stories that come out of the Vietnam War, most of them are, are, are tragic. 
they are really in, in terms of the losses, the, the lives that were lost, and the legacy that the, the war continues to give us to today. <coughs> so, the casualty field for me, as a, as a child growing up, I really didn't understand the impact of my own family. But as I grew older and I began to research my own family, especially that in the service of my grandfather, I understood that my family, one amongst millions in America, is one of those families that has been impacted by war. Not only by an American service member who has served in combat, combat, but also having lost a family member in combat. So this photograph here, which I found in family archives, shows two of my family members. You probably recognize the gentleman on the far left. That is my grandfather, who we saw in the previous photo. He is, he is dark complexion because he was a Mexican-American having been born on the border and raised in El Paso, Texas. To his left, the younger slight man, is his nephew. So George Vial on the left and on the right is at that point Army Private First Class Reynaldo Mijares. Mm -hmm. That's the name. Reynaldo Mijares of Carlsbad, New Mexico. Reynaldo is my grandfather's nephew. My grandfather was the youngest of seven and so his older sister, having children years before him, meant that Reynaldo was only about 10 years in difference between my grandfather at the time of the photograph, who was 32, Reynaldo was about 22. Does anyone recognize the two banners on the screen? Yes, ma'am, do you know what these are? A blue is um, your, you have someone in service, yeah. and gold is someone who passed away. Exactly right. And women used to hang them in their window. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. During probably World War II. II. Yes, ma'am. These are known as the, the, the star banners. The blue star, as, as the, the kind lady told us, the blue star in the case that your service member is serving in the military. And the gold, of course, in the case that your, your loved one was lost in combat. They were killed in action, probably. These banners began around 1917 during World War I, and they rose to prominence in World War I, and then especially in World War II where we had upwards of 20 million Americans who were serving throughout both many, many conflicts or many campaigns from, from World War II. They're still used today, but they're not quite as, as, as prominent as they once were. So in this, these two men, these two banners are represented. My grandfather, having served and returned, thankfully, perhaps only by a miracle that he survived a full year of combat in Italy between the years 1944 and 1945. He really should not have survived. But by some miracle, he came back to his family and resumed his life. At that point, my father had already been born in 1933, so he saw his father go to the war. Reynaldo, unfortunately, was the one who did not return from World War II. Reynaldo, being my, my grandfather's nephew, this photo was taken when they were on leave right before they were both shipped off to Europe and where they really began their military careers in combat. My father was sent to Italy, which is a, a horrific campaign, which history really overlooks in terms of, of its ferocity. Reynaldo went to Northwest Europe, and tragically, Reynaldo was part of the largest unit captured in U.S. Army history when he was captured by the Germans on the 16th of December, 1944, at the onset of the Battle of the Bulge. Sadly, Reynaldo was captured, went into the German prisoner of war system. He died in the prisoner of war camp in late March of 1945, less than one month before the camp was liberated by American forces in April of 1945. And so, in the Ward family, he represent the, the highs and lows of combat. That my grandfather returns home to his family, scarred, yes, but intact. And unfortunately, his his own sister's family did not have that same gift that their loved one did not return home from life. On a side note, even though the family was notified in 1945 that Reynaldo had died in captivity, it took another three years before his body was returned to Carlsbad, New Mexico. So we look at the impact that war has on American families, and it is often excruciating. And we'll, we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit with these stories we'll talk about today. As I said, America has an incredible devotion to bring home our home. We go back to Ranger Creek.
Infantry, the United States Army Rangers is a, a unique organization. They're a special operation. They've been around since World War II. They have a, a stanza. They have a creed, but that is six stanzas long. It's like a large oath, and you must memorize it in which to become a United States Army Ranger. The fifth stanza of the Ranger Creed reads, I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. That's quite, that's quite a lie. And we know that's not always possible in the sense that if you go down in combat, I may not able, be able to get you, if at all possible. But I'll tell you what, I will sure, I will sure try to bring you home. And that oath continues today with the nation's commitment to bring home our fallen in whatever capacity. This is a somber sight. For those of you who have been to Washington, D.C., you understand exactly where that photo was taken. That's Arlington National Cemetery, where upwards of 350,000 American patients are buried on the grounds of Arlington National Cemetery. <coughs> so we talked about the casualties of the United States military. There are three main categories that we, we follow in terms of the impact that war has created. The first one, of course, is killed in action where an individual has been, has been killed in the, in the line of duty, wherever that may be, their ship sank, their airplane crashed, or their tank was struck by, by another tank. Wounded in action. It's pretty straightforward. If you're wounded in action, then you're carrying the classification of WIA. At that point, if you're wounded and you return home, you're then awarded the Purple Heart Medal, which is no small thing. And then finally, MIA. We, we hear that term a lot. MIA is missing in action, which means we don't know, the United States military doesn't know where you're at, and they don't know what happened to you. You could be alive, but we can't account for you because we just don't know what happened to you. Your plane crashed, you were taken captive, something along those lines. Of the three classifications, none of them are particularly warm or, or positive to a family member. But in my experience in the casualty field, perhaps the one that brings the most grief is the last one, missing in action. Because more often than not, the American service member has been killed in action, but their body was never recovered. And so at that point, the family member, from the, the onset of the time that they're notified, now it becomes a period of uncertainty, of not knowing what happened to my loved one. And sometimes, a month becomes a year, a year becomes a decade, and suddenly it becomes a large span of time in terms of not knowing where their loved one is. And so these families in the MI live with an incredible, incredible amount of uncertainty, but they keep the hope up that maybe, just maybe one day, my loved one will be found. So our story today will deal with really looking for recovery and ultimately identifying our MIA for missing in action. This photo is very, very typical of what U.S. teams do year in, year out, and they have been for the last five decades, since Vietnam. We deploy teams around the world in every environment possible to essentially look for our fallen. And oftentimes, as much as you would like it to be, we're Indiana Jones, where you, you come into the clearing and there is some magnificent structure that indicates you're in the right spot, or to equate, equate to this story, you walk into the jungle and suddenly you see the, the, the plane, air, air, the tail of an airplane sticking out of the ground, and you're thinking, ah, this is it, we found the plane crash. That is extremely, extremely remote these days. Typically when the teams show up, it's this. It's just a landscape that indicates nothing that happened there. The only way we know that something may have happened there is we talk to the locals, we conduct interviews, and then if we think something has happened there, uh, a tank stopped, an airplane crashed, then we pull out the metal detectors and we cord it off just like an archaeological dig and we begin to sweep. We're looking for metal. And if it gets hits, then we know we're in the right spot. And at that point, we turn the archaeologists and they begin to instruct us to dig. And so the teams did. We spend upwards of 30 days on a site, sometimes even longer, and in many cases, the site cannot be done in 30 days, so we'll just schedule with the host country to come back at a different time in which to continue to dig. So you, you think, well, what are we looking for? What are these teams hoping to find? The three main things, the three main 
forms of evidence that the recovery teams are hoping to find, hoping to find. Of course, if we're looking for a fallen American, then we're hoping to find part of the body. Sure, that makes sense. Of course, after decades, at best we're going to find the skeleton. I hope. The next thing that we're looking for, if, we, if we're if hopefully have luck and fortune on our side, we're looking for anything that the warrior was wearing. Uh, the term that we used in my laboratory days was the life sciences equipment. That's just a fancy technical term for whatever the warrior was wearing at the time of his loss. In this case here, if, if it's a pilot loss, which typically were the cases that we, we, we worked in my laboratory, we're looking for all the gear that the pilot was wearing at the time of the loss. It's quite a bit of gear. And with a lot of that gear worn, typically we're going to find some fragment of that, that, that life sciences equipment at the site where we're digging. Finally, if the warrior was lost in a vehicle, which most typically they were, specifically an aircraft, we're looking for part of the aircraft, whatever it is. It could be a wheel, it could be a landing strut, it could be the data plate. Those things we're looking for when we show up at the site. But there is never any guarantee that we're going to find what we're hoping to find. Briefly, before we talk about the life sciences gear, let's just kind of do a quick anthropological quiz. So the human body is quite durable. Can anyone tell me what the most durable part of your body is? What is the part that we are most likely to find after decades of searching? Yes, ma'am. The teeth. The teeth, yes. Exactly. Makes sense, right? Can you tell me what part of the tooth is the most durable part? You think of the top of your tooth, right? What's that called? Enamel. The enamel of the crown. Right? It's, it makes sense. It's the top part of our tooth. We chew with it, we grind, and that's going to be the most durable part. More than likely, if, if we're at a site, we're going to find, hopefully, hopefully, find part of the skeleton. In very rare cases, there's only a certain amount of teeth in your, in your skull, right? But in some cases, we have found the tooth. And in that case, the tooth has been whittled down to only the crown remains. And in certain environments around the world, depending on where our teams show up, it could be the hills of Burma, it could be the deserts of North Africa, or it could be the jungles of Southeast Asia. The, the environmental conditions will dictate how much of your body remains. And in Vietnam and Southeast Asia, it is the worst possible environment for preserving the, the human body on the face of the planet. There are several reasons for that. Southeast Asia is very humid, which means it has a lot of precipitation, a lot of rainfall, and the soils are very rich in nutrients. They're organic, which makes the soils very, very acidic. And so when a team shows up in South Vietnam, like we were just showing, we hope to find part of the body, but now it's five, six decades after the fact, we're not able to find part of the body because the body has been broken down and it has been consumed by nature. It is eroded. And in many cases, we have found scant pieces of the crown of one tooth, and that was all that remained of the American warrior. And in many cases, we found absolutely nothing of the body because the body had been consumed by nature. There's one thing that nature will typically not consume, and it is things that are man-made. Synthetics, the modern arrival of textiles just after World War II meant that the military began to use more advanced materials. Nylon, rayon, plastics started to be used. In this case here, the life sciences here were part of the team, the recovery team, or, or the analysts back in the laboratory looking at these artifacts. These are things we're hoping to find in the things that are recovered from these dig sites. If we're dealing with the pilot, we're hoping to find part of his flight suit, excuse me, flight helmet, oxygen mask, torso harness, survival vest, anti-G suit, life preserver, his pistol, his belt, and his combat boots. It's a lot of gear. So this photo here taken about 1968, it's a young Nate, or correction, a young Air Force captain. He is an Air Force Phantom pilot, and he is wearing a lot of kit. He's wearing a lot of gear. And if this man was lost in, in North Vietnam, then hopefully we would find some portions of those artifacts in which to understand what happened to this young man, which we'll certainly speak about in detail. 
So you think, okay, well, so you find some of these things. You find that you're digging in the soil and you, you hold up an artifact and think, wow, that shit looks familiar. Man, where have I seen that before? Ah, that is the, the metal receiver used on this oxygen mask that I hold in my hand that I found at this site. And you do the, the, the cumulative analysis of what is found, and these are the questions that we would ask ourselves in the, the laboratory analysis. One, based on the artifacts that were recovered and their quality and their condition and their quantity, what is the number of in, involved persons that we can we can determine? If enough artifacts are found, ladies and gentlemen, we can usually determine how many people were involved. Two, looking at the artifacts, can we understand the survivability of the warrior? Do we understand what happened when he was lost? Those indicators are still showing on the artifacts. Three, what branch of service are we dealing with? Absolutely. Big, big question. If, if we dispatch our team to look for a, a lost Marine Corps fan, lost over Laos on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, you're open to find Marine Corps artifacts. Exactly. Four, what vehicle type and escape system is represented? Specifically, if your team, if my team is looking for a Navy A6 intruder lost in North Vietnam, then hopefully, ideally, we should be finding parts that are associated with an A6. And if there's an ejection seat involved, we are open to find those as well. Five, big one. What time frame is represented by these artifacts? Huge. These are all forensic tools that we're using to understand is the forensic evidence that is recovered, does it match the, the lost site that we're dealing with? Five, or correction, six. Are the artifacts consistent with the loss of one another? These are all, all questions that we continually ask ourselves to understand what are the artifacts telling us. So quickly, I'm going to, to give you a, a case study of the young man we saw on slide one. This is an actual case that I worked well over 20 years ago. And it is symbolic of all these cases and, and trying to understand what, what significance the artifacts and the forensic science tells us. This is the, the type of aircraft he was shot down in, in October of 1967. This is a United States Navy A4E Skyhawk. It's a single seat attack aircraft, as you can see, that was taken on a combat mission because he has bombs loaded up on both wings and the center tank has his fuel. His squadron is in the lower left. That is the squadron insignia of attack squadron 163, known as the Saints, which we'll discuss here in detail. There he is again. Whenever we do a case, ladies and gentlemen, this is not just a number, this is not just something that came out of a, a folder or a bag of artifacts. This dealt with an American who was lost in action, a human, an actual individual just like us. So we have to understand who he was. As I said before, this is United States Naval Lieutenant Jeffrey Martin Crumman Oak, born in 1940. He was the oldest of three kids of his two parents and born and raised in Sioux City, Iowa. Smart kid, he went to Iowa State University. He enrolled in the Naval ROTC program where he came out and he wanted to become a Naval aviator. And that's exactly what he, he became. He became a Naval aviator and went to a tour in Vietnam in 1965. But at that point, very early in the war, he's flying propeller driven aircraft, boring holes in the sky, flying around as an airborne warning. Okay, he served his nation, yes. But I'm sure to this young man, he was thinking, I need, I need something a little faster. This is uh, just a little bit too slow for me. So he comes back, and in 1966, he raises his hand. He says, hey, Navy, I want to get trained to go to the Jets. And at that point, the war in Vietnam was escalating tremendously. And the Navy says, you want to fly jets? We sure can use you. And they pulled him in, and he's retrained as a jet pilot in early 1967. There he is when... Lieutenant Crumman Oak showed up to the squadron in September of 1967. These are actual photographs that came out of his casualty file. In those photos, it looks all business because that's, that's exactly what was happening. When Jeff Crumman Oak showed up at that squadron in September of 1967, he did not know, and the Navy did not know, that he had just been assigned to the Navy unit, the attack unit, that would incur the greatest loss rate of any unit in the Vietnam War. 1967, ladies and gentlemen, was the high point of the air war in Vietnam. It was absolutely relentless. It was not uncommon for naval aviators and even Air Force guys flying daily 
In some cases, naval aviators were flying combat missions three times a day. A day. It was that ferocious. The cycle was relentless. It was a meat grinder. And these guys were stepping up to the plate and they were performing incredibly, in spite of incredible, incredible odds and in, in spite of, of tremendous challenges. He shows up to the squadron, ladies and gentlemen, on September 8th, 1967. He is shot down in MIA on the 25th of October. He was in the squadron 47 days before he went to MIA. Not even two months. That's where the war was at. He was coming in to replace other guys who had been shot down, and he comes into the pipeline, he does his job, and less than two months later, Jeffrey Krumenho now is MIA. He went missing on a major strike, which is an airfield located north of Hanoi. All they know is that he was doing his job trying to get away from the missiles that were in the air. I spoke to one pilot on this mission, similar to this. This pilot told me on that mission to strike the airfield on the 25th of October 1967, they counted upwards of 50 anti-aircraft missiles that would have been fired against a U.S. force. 50 missiles at the air. We're talking a missile the size of a telephone pole traveling at Mach 2. It's radar guided, and if it locks on you, you better be on your game, and you better try to evade the missile, because if you're not fast enough, it will hit you. Here's the aircraft that uh, the Kroger home was flying, very similar. And if you look at the map there, that's the old map of South and North Vietnam during the war. If you see up here, this is Hanoi. That is the capital of North Vietnam. The airfield was located just adjacent to ha Hanoi. So the aircraft carriers are here in the Gulf of Tonkin, and they're launching, and they're flying into North Vietnam. And they're flying into the most heavily defended airspace in the history of mankind. The North Vietnamese had amassed anti-aircraft guns that outnumbered the Germans in World War II. So the minute that our boys had flown over the beach, is what they call flying over land, it was a very, very serious situation. So I'm going to test your musical history quite quick. Take it back. 1965 was a major hit. It was called Downtown. Are you ready the song? Yeah. Who was the artist? Do you remember? The was the artist? Yeah. Beautiful. It's, it's a really, I, it was a little bit before my time, but I love the song. It's very light. It's back when we had it downtown, right? When we go downtown and ride the bus and we shop, it was a, a magnificent time. But Tula Clark's talking about going downtown and seeing the shops and window shopping and just enjoying being a young person in, in a downtown environment. The flip side is the pilots. The pilots took that song and they turned it around and they said, when we go downtown, that means we're going to see the elephant. So down, going downtown meant we're going to, to, to see the action. And it was not meant in a, in a lighthearted way. Going down, downtown meant that you were, you were going to really meet an enemy who was, who was doing their best to kill you. You became extremely, extremely hostile. This is an actual photo, not taken of, of criminal Oaks loss, but this was taken in 1967. This is one of those missiles that we're talking about, right? Service to air missile. We can't see it because the trajectory has now flown clean through, but as this Air Force jet was traveling, the missile tracking it through radar exploded near and exploded and detonated and blew up, but it struck the aircraft and continued to fly. We don't know what happened to Jeff Cohen Hope on that mission because nobody had the ability to look around to see what their buddies were doing. When the American forces showed up on the 25th of October 1967, it was all on. And you can bet the North Vietnamese had established an air defense against that airfield. That was terrific. Service to air missiles, anti-aircraft guns, you name it. They probably looked at the 4th of July. And so when the American pilots come on station to drop their bombs or to attack the gun sites, you're only focused on doing your job. You, you have no idea what your guys are doing because you're only focused on hitting your target, lining it up, dropping your bombs, and getting out of there back to the carrier. So we're really not sure exactly what got him that day, but he did not return back to the carrier. And so 1967 turned into 1970, 1970 into 1980, into 1990. There was no sign of what happened to Jeff Cromwell. Until the early 90s, when relations began to thaw under President Bill Clinton with the diplomatic relations with now the, the Vietnamese, because now they're one unified country. 
we began to gain access to the sites that we thought held where our Americans had fallen. We'd never been to these sites before because the country had been inaccessible. But in 1995, one of the early teams is able to get to a village where they think, where they think, Jeff Cominhoff went down. And they begin to dig. And you can see your point of reference, it's like a big patio. This is an actual person. And we see that the team has dug almost the size of a swimming pool by hand. And they're digging. And they dig probably at least upwards of 30 days. This is quite a job here. And because this is so early in 1995, only probably just short of 30 years since Jeff went missing, they're hoping to find significant artifacts, and they do. So after this time digging, they begin to find things like this. These photographs were taken by my laboratory after they had been removed from the ground, bagged in the tory, and sent to my laboratory back in 2000. But this, these are the artifacts that are coming out of that hole that we think dealt with the loss of Jeff Cronin. This here, you can see what looks to be a brown garment that is in fact a flight suit. And you see this unique detail. This is what we look for. If you are a forensic analyst, you're looking for a very unique detail on the artifacts. Something that stands out. So here you see a square Velcro piece. And you see kind of a rounded contour. And you're thinking, I've seen that before. You pull out your original sample, your original flight suit, and you try to match up where this artifact came from. In this case here, this is dealing with the, the right side collar of the flight suit. This is the same flight suit that he would have worn in 1967. Uh, it came out of my collection. Uh, I'm a collector. I'm a junkie. So I have a lot of these things in my collection. This is the actual flight suit here. It's not particularly attractive, but it did its job. It's completely fire resistant. What we call Nomex. The pilots today still wear it. So this is the flight suit that he would have been wearing, and it's kind of hard to see, but that little square Velcro is right here. And that's found on the right underside of the right side of the collar. So at the laboratory, we had thousands of reference samples that we would use because when the artifact would come out of the ground, you would think, well, I know where that artifact, I know where it came from. Okay, prove it. Identify, associate it. So we would pull the artifact out to the sample and we would make comparisons. Moving on. The artifact, of course, is the, the, the items that are fragmented here. So this is the actual artifact overlaid onto what we call the master reference. It's pretty obvious what that is. It is the outsole portion off of a left boot worn by Navy pilots in 1967. Very unique tread. It's, it's lugged. It's a mountain hiking outsole, which was unique. It was unique because the, the boot that they gave you as a Navy pilot didn't have the sole. But as the pilots began to fly combat missions over Vietnam, they thought, if I get shot down and I'm wearing a boot like this with no outsole on it, I don't want to be trying to escape in the jungle with no traction. I want to resole my boot so I can have traction. This is the boot that they actually resold with. So this matches up perfectly to this boot, the master reference here, was about a size 12. And the artifact matched perfectly in its diameter to a size 12 boot. That was important. Moving on, other life sciences gear that the artifacts were telling us where they came from and what they were. Kind of hard to see, but this is his, his parachute harness, the master reference. The artifact is here. It's a tattered bit of nylon webbing but it equates to the life preserver attachment band that was mounted on the waist portion of his parachute harness. Very, very clearly we have this unique webbing in its, its woven design. We also have here the stitching, which matches up to the waistband here. Okay, moving on there. These four artifacts. Here we go. Four pieces there, <coughs> huge in terms of their true significance. All the four items originate out off the flight hall. All of them. Okay. 
So the detail, of course, is key. And so I brought a few examples to show you. So this this is an APH six flight helmet identical to one Jet wore in nineteen sixty seven. The the little knob that you see there that is the, the top of the lock knob on the flight helmet. The blue chin strap here. The the fiberglass portion. The shell is fiberglass, and so that portion originates to the back helmet shell of the helmet. And this mangled piece here equates to the chin strap attached to part of the shell. So all of these artifacts are they're telling us a story, and they're, they're giving us extreme amounts of detail that cannot be found anywhere else. Now keep in mind, we're looking for the three forms of artifacts, so the, the, the evidentiary forms from the site, the human body, the life sciences gear, and the aircraft wreckage. Only this level of detail is only found in the life sciences gear, what the wear, warrior is wearing. You couldn't get that from a boner team. And the aircraft wreckage is not going to tell you the specific specificity that we are seeing here. We're going to come back to this. These pieces here carry a tremendous amount of weight in the overall deductions that we've reached. There's our helmet there. This is a dual visor, which is identical with the exception of this being a single visor. Here's our chin strap, blue nylon, unmistakable. And the fiberglass piece originates there to the rear, left rear, right rear corner of the helmet shell. Important, important, very important. Moving on to other artifacts that were recovered. It's, it's very difficult to see this, this nylon piece here equates to the survival vest that was worn by the pilot. You have these vertical channels here and here. This is the right front pocket on the survival vest, which would have carried his flare gun and his pistol, worn by the pilot throughout the entire flight. Now the big piece here, the artifact, of course, to the master reference, this is the life preserver. So let me back up. So keep in mind what we're dealing with. Flight helmet, dorsal harness, parachute harness. Flight helmet again. Survival vest, life preserver. This is all building, it's a building and evidentiary story. This unique buckle here, obviously the artifact, this is the connection part coming off his, his safety belt, which is attached to part of the parachute, which is then stored in the ejection seat. So, those are just a fraction of the artifacts, by the way. Those were not all of them. We had many, many, many more. But what the evidentiary story was telling us is what, what equipment items were accounted for. What did we identify? What do they mean? We identified the helmet, the oxygen mask, the torso harness, the vest, life preserver, the G-suit, and his boots. So you can think, okay, well, Alex, you've identified the artifacts. Well, so what? What else? You have to corroborate your findings with historical record. You just can't say they are what they are. So in this case here, I found a photograph of this young man, United States Navy Lieutenant Junior Grade Dave Carey, who was a squadron member to Jeff Cronenhoek. Except Dave Carey had been shot down a month prior. Same squadron. So we have a photograph, a, a record of what year they are wearing in that squadron. So this is a form of evidence which is huge because it's a it's a reference point. Here's that flight suit, here's our oxygen mask, here's our unique parachute harness, same G suit. Guess what, folks? Here's that boot with a heavy lead sole. Shown in that photograph. You find photographs like that and you're on the right track because now you're saying the photo itself is verifying what the artifacts are because it's a it's an irrefutable reference point. That was a, a huge, huge find for that photograph. When the laboratory was set these artifacts, all 
in Ziploc bags that had come out of the field probably early 2000. So they had been sent after processing in, 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 uh, in Hawaii, they had been sent to the laboratory for analysis. We, we, we saw the bags probably at the top of 2001. And as we're going through the bags, and by that point, I, 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 I was very educated in terms of what, what these things meant, what the artifacts were, what the equipment items were. And as we're sorting through the bags, I hold up this artifact in the bag. And I pull it out, and it's, it was really only about this big, not very big. And I held it up, and I knew in an instant, without any question, that this state, this case dealt with the loss of Jeff Criminal. Of this artifact, one, one artifact. I ask you to look at it, and I, I ask you, what unique markings do you see? Anyone? What, what do you see in terms of uh, geometric pattern? What are we looking at there on this artifact? Square helmet. Because square on squares. Yes, they're obviously beat up. We see one square here, part of square here, square here, square here. What does that pattern remind you? Checkerboard. Checkerboard. And what color are they? What color are the checkerboards? Blue. Ladies and gentlemen, only one squadron in the United States Navy served in the Vietnam War. One. Use blue checkerboards as part of the squadron insignia on the flight helmet. That is Jeff Kromenhoek in his cockpit, taken probably weeks before he was lost on the 25th of October 1967. He's wearing a dual visor APH-6 flight helmet that sports blue checkerboards on the visor house. So when we deal with the artifacts and the, the information they, they provided us as analysts and historians, we cannot underestimate the power and the significance of the information that they trans that they, they gave to us. They conveyed tremendous amounts of information that cannot be found anywhere else. So of one artifact that we we saw in those bags that showed blue checkers, we knew exactly without any any shadow of a doubt we were dealing with the equipment systems worn by Jeffrey Martin Cromenhoek on the day that he had parted this earth while holding his suit. So quite, quite amazing. Unfortunately, sadly, because as we talked about with the human body being very fragile in terms of, of its preservation in very harsh environments like Southeast Asia, the team never did find any human remains of Jeffrey Cromenhoek. But based on the equipment, we know exactly what happened to Jeff Cromenhoek on that day. We don't know what happened to him in terms of how he was shot down. Either a missile has struck his aircraft, or as he was coming in on his bomb run to take, take out that anti-aircraft gun, he may have been hit by anti-aircraft artillery. Whatever the case is, Jeff was not able to eject in time. He's, he's sitting in an ejection seat, and he has two handles. He has a handle above his head, and he has a handle beneath his knees. Whatever reason, we'll never know. He was able to eject, and he did not escape the aircraft before it crashed into the ground and exploded. So this young man, this young man belongs to a Bolstar family because he made the ultimate sacrifice while doing his job in defense of his nation and in defense of his, of his fellow brothers. I, I wish we could say that we could say that his case is closed. It is not because given the bureaucracy of the American government, the only way you can close out a case specifically is if you find part of the body. And unfortunately, that's not realistic. I wish we were able to give the family some closure by saying we know exactly what happened to Jeff because we have an artifact that pertains to, to how he was lost, but we're not able to do that, unfortunately. And because no part of the body is found, there it, the case remains open today. Every American war, especially Vietnam, deals with the loss of Americans, young Americans, not much older than the young youngsters there in the back of the room today. In many cases, probably the same age as many of you. 
like seeing the early 20s. And so the Vietnam War was no exception, and it, it built and it stole and it robbed this nation. Uh, not men like these. Every man on this screen, I do not know personally, but I have worked their case, so I know them in a way. Quickly, on the upper left, Richard Reardon, Powell Castle, Michael Schiffernacher, George Page, Ralph Biz, Michael Davis O'Donnell, Kelly Patterson, and Jim Mills. These, these men all share the commonality that they're all young. They're in those photographs, they're all vibrantly, fantastically young. They're all under the age of 30. And so they, they still continue to live in these photographs. The other bond that they share is they were all Indian from different services, lost in action in the Vietnam War. Two of these men, although they're all fantastic and special to me, two stand out for two different reasons. Ralph Biz lost August 4th, 1967 over in North Vietnam, and Michael Davis O'Donnell, the United States Army, shot down on the 24th of May, 1970. These men, these men never knew each other, but they were lost tragically in the war in Vietnam. These two men stand out for me for two very special reasons, which we'll touch on here very, very quickly. Does anyone recognize this sacred place? Yes. Yes. What, what is this monument in, in the hallowed capital of the United States of America? Yeah. This is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, also known as the Wall. Maya Lin. Maya Lin. Maya Lin. Maya Lin. The genius. Her father. Wow. The genius of a 20 year old Yale architecture student of Asian descent yeah. that devised this incredible, amazing architectural tribute to men that we just showed you. All 58,000 plus names are inscribed on this wall, starting at the apex here and working eastward and then resuming again on their names in chronological order until the beginning and the end merge at the, the center. If any of you ever get to DC, I highly encourage you to visit this, this incredible monument. It is probably not completely unique in the world, but to the United States, it is incredibly unique because this is one of the few and only war monuments that contains the name of every American lost in the Vietnam War between the years 1954 and 1975. So I leave you with a closer image of the sacred wall. This is a photograph that I took when I was at the wall in October of 2008. And at that time, working for the Department of Navy as a casualty assistance call officer, I had the profound, the life-changing honor of serving as the military escort officer for young, one young American who had been found, recovered, and identified from the Vietnam War. And that was Ralph C. Biz. In the montage, he was the young man on the far, the far lower left. At the time the photo was taken, on the wall, next to his name is inscribed a cross. Everyone else around him has a diamond. The diamond indicates that that service member was killed in action. But at the time the wall was built in 1982, the cross meant that the individual was still missing in action. So I'm happy to understand, and I'm happy to tell you that today, this has been converted to a diamond. So having identified and returned Ralph C. Biz to his family, we interred Ralph Biz. His parents sadly had passed away, not knowing what happened to him, but his first cousins, who were his family, really, his siblings, if you will, were there when we interred him in October of 2008 on an incredible, amazing, day in which to honor and bring this young man home. In addition to Ralph Biz, I leave you with a stanza from a poem, and I know it's difficult to read, but I'll read it for you. If you are able, save them a place inside you, and save one backward glance when you are leaving 
but the places they can no longer go. This poem was written by the other young man that I told you, Michael Davis O'Donnell, who was shot down and went missing in action in March of 1970. So what better point to leave you with, with the photograph of Ralph is his name on the wall and the poem written by Michael Davis O'Donnell. I'm thankful to say both men have been identified and recovered and returned, and they were received by their families in the subsequent years after the loss. So at this time, this concludes my presentation, and I would like to open it up for any questions you may have. Yes, ma'am. I have two. One, um, don't their dog tags survive? Yes, ma'am. Well, ideally, if it's all right, these are my wall one dog tags. They're circular, but they're aluminum. They're very, very sturdy. They hold up very well. Ideally, uh, a service member would wear these into combat, yes. However, in Vietnam, it's not uncommon for these law sites to be scavenged. The, the locals are very industrious, and they're, 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 they're scavenging for metal. And something like this would be also considered valuable, valuable to, to sell. And so we're not the first of these sites. A lot of these sites we reach, and they have been, they've been scavenged for decades. The things that they're not interested in finding are ironically the, the fabric and other piece, pieces of life sciences here that, that have had those conflicts too. On very rare occasion, though, man, on very rare occasion, we do find a dog tag. But it is, it is very rare. I have a question is when they're digging, do they find ordinances, and are they affected by Agent Orange? Yes, ma'am. Uh, any, any of those threats is always is always a great concern. Every team that's deployed around the world has an explosive ordnance disposal specialist. We call him EOD guy. He's the bomb guy because if we're doing a, a metal detector sweep and we hit something and we start digging up and we find this baseball-sized spherical item, we know it's a cluster bomb unit. And we back off and we say, okay, Mike, it's all yours. And he'll do his expertise to isolate it. He'll pull it out and he'll transport it very, very carefully to a safe spot away from the dig site in which to hold in place or detonate at a later time. But unexploded, unexploded ordinance is a, is a huge concern for any team in the world. Yes, sir. And how about Agent Orange? Agent Orange, uh, I think it would not be so much of a concern because you would need long term exposure. And it's been 50 years since the war, so a lot of the herbicides that were sprayed have degraded and been absorbed. So the threat to the team is, is not so not so great. But the, the, the ordinance itself is a huge concern. We have been on sites where we have found unexploded bombs. I, I visited one site in 1997 where we must have collected about 15 cluster bomb units that were just spread all over that the plane had been carrying. And you would even have to be very careful on how he transported them because they're extremely safe. Thank you. Anyone else? Question, sir. Just an observation. Uh, Maya Lynn and Dr. Henry Lynn, her father, were harassed when they designed the Vietnam Veterans Memorial because it was a wedge in the ground and not of white marble. Their uh, mailboxes were firebombed. They were told they were un-American go back to where you came from. And Maya, when I last spoke to her, which had been a decade ago, said she would never again design a monument in the United States of America, mm. her home, mm. for the way she was treated mm. over that monument, the most visited monument in Washington. Absolutely, what a, what a tragic end story to an incredible design. Still, we know that, that her design is lasting yes. and it carries a tremendous amount of- It's incredibly powerful. powerful. It is. Very much so. Thank you, sir. Last question. Yes, ma'am. My brother was a B-52 bomber navigator um, with more than a thousand missions mm -hmm. over Vietnam. He survived the war, but he's buried at Arlington because he died of multiple myeloma associated with the Agent Orange that was carried in the bomb bay of the planes. His location on the plane was down underneath. Uh, as, as a navigator where all the electronics were. And for him to get to the flight deck, he had to travel through the bomb bay. And they apparently were assigned, the whole unit went over 
on an American base, and they stayed with those planes the entire months that they were there. So he was in that plane or those planes every day. Yeah. Even if something is, is uh, unlikely in terms of you would not call them jungle, but yet he still exposed to these horrific defaults that are everywhere. Yeah. And, and he, he was. Just because they carried it. That's right. So thank you for your, your brother's service. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a tragedy that Agent Lawrence took in Tucson, uh, like many, many other Americans, unfortunately. Yes, Andy. Well, thank you for your service. Thank you. And you made it so real for us by showing the picture of the soldier at the beginning. And you were focusing on him, his case, and his equipment that you found. And it was just heart wrenching. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, certainly a, a story that needs to be told of, of every young American that we lost in Southeast Asia, and especially those that took decades for them to find their Thank you. Yes, sir. I had the honor to attend a final salute ceremony last Thursday. Mm -hmm. And the Rolling Thunder motorcycle, or the PI, M I A E O W, they had 81,000 people still on the M I A list. Is that true? Not from Vietnam. No, from, from World War One to yes. now. Yes, sir. Eighty-one thousand. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. In an aggregate total from World War Two, we're not even probably including World War One, which had its own. The the wars combined have accumulated upwards of probably ninety to one hundred thousand Americans that never returned, that they were unaccounted for. Young men like Paul or like like Chuck coming home and others that simply just didn't come home because we didn't know what happened to him. So Vietnam was was I pray the last of the wars that, that generated missing Americans. But between the lion's share of Vietnam, which generated about three thousand missing in action, then Korea about seven thousand, and then the lion's share of course is World War II with eighty thousand Americans unaccounted for. So quite quite a few. Yes, ma'am. Interested in doing a documentary like you just presented to us at all? It would be fantastic to, to really get that story out. That needs to. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of work that needs to occur within the bureaucracy of our own government that is so restrictive in its 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 U.S. code that cases like Jeff Krumenhoek should be allowed to be closed if the family so desired. And they're not allowed to. They're not allowed to because the agencies that run it today only see success in one form, and that is we have to find your body. And you think, well, what happens if you can't find my body? Well, I guess it's you're just going to stay open until perpetuity. That's just not right. Absolutely not right. In this case here, ladies and gentlemen, the case of uh, Refno, we call Refno 0875, reference number 0875, which is the numeral assigned to the Jeff Krumenow's case. In terms of its overall quality, if I rated it on a scale of zero for being very, very poor to 10 being extremely high, I would rate this case at a 9.5 on terms of its ability to, to unmistakably, unmistakably state through the forensic science what happened to Jeff Cohen. A 9.5. And yet here we are all these years later and it's still there. So a lot of work gets to be, needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Educational and incredibly touching. Thank you. Join us on the 18th of October when the Harmon Museum players <clears throat> are going to present for you uh, a little thing that's sort of patterned after Edgar Lee Masters' Spoon River Anthology, but based on some local tales, just in time for Halloween. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.